Hello friends, this is Steve from Southern Illinois. Sorry I'm late today. I guess my body just needs some extra sleep through the night. And I've got a cat joining me here, so I periodically may have to spend some, spend some attention down that way. So, thank you for joining me again. The title of this week's Discover Bible Guide was Bridge to a Satisfying Life. We've all just experienced the discrepancy between what we envision life as being and what we are experiencing. In fact, I would assert that those of us who are trying to live a meaningful life, a spiritual life, uh, are much more aware of this than many others. Um, that discrepancy of something that motivates and challenges us on a daily basis. The Bible asserts that Jesus bridges the chasm of failure and sin and death that separates us from our goal, a life that is meaningful and satisfying. St. Louis lies about two hours west of us. <clears throat> And um, it's the site of what the New York Times once called the eighth wonder of the world. And I'm not talking about the St. Louis Arch. No, what I'm talking about is a bridge that almost no one notices, but it transformed bridge building, transportation, and construction in general almost 150 years ago. Before the American Civil War, <clears throat> goods on the West uh, moved via steamboats. Goods came from Europe and from the East Coast and traveled down around Florida to New Orleans where they were put on steamboats coming up the river. And these large steamboats coming up from New Orleans could go as far as St. Louis but shortly after St. Louis, as you go north, the Mississippi and the Missouri River split, and neither of them is big enough to support boats of that size. So St. Louis was a transition point. Passengers and cargo were offloaded in St. Louis and placed on these smaller boats going up the Missouri or through up the upper Mississippi. Now, before the Civil War, railroads started proliferating. And as they did so, traffic on the river started dropping. People could travel overland directly from the East Coast to their destination without going all the way down and around and all of the hassles. The Civil War only exacerbated the problem because now the Confederates controlled New Orleans and goods and passengers just dried up. And Mississippi had been the backbone of the economy of St. Louis. This was a big crisis for them. And local leaders began agitating to build a bridge across the Mississippi River so that railroads could have direct access to the city. Their dreams didn't go unnoticed. Their competitors in Chicago had been benefiting from this problem. See, Chicago has ready access to railroads. It's just flat land, and the railroads could go in there with no problems. There was no river in the way. And so Chicago was rapidly replacing St. Louis as the economic hub, and they had no intention of relinquishing that position. So they cast about, and they found a willing bridge builder. And they lobbied the Illinois legislature to give this bridge builder exclusive rights to building a bridge to St. Louis. They even had the support of St. Louis interests. I mean, why not let Illinois pay for our bridge? <laughs> Except 
There was no bridge forthcoming. It was all a sham. They just wanted to lock up the contract so nobody else could step in to build the bridge. Finally, after the Civil War, uh, help came from an unexpected source. Andrew Carnegie, a steel, the steel magnate, was having difficulty negotiating with the railroads and transporting his goods to the West because uh, monopolies were forming in the railroads and uh, competition was disappearing. And he wanted to stimulate competition, so he told St. Louis that if they got into trouble by defying the Illinois legislatures and building a bridge, he would support them in co court and document uh, how damaging this monopoly was to his business. So they started planning a bridge. But then they ran into other problems. You see, the Chicago interests were not the only ones that were opposed to the bridge. The steamboat owners were as well. Why would they want the railroads having ready access to St. Louis? Their business would get, e get even worse. So they lobbied the Missouri legislature to put restrictions on this bridge such that it wouldn't impede the, the steamboats. So, number one, it could not be built in a fashion that blocked the river at any time. They couldn't put up coffer dams and, and, and build inside the dams. Okay. It had to be at least 50 feet over the clearance above the surface of the water so that the steamboats could pass underneath with their tall, their tall smokestacks. And the center span had to be at least 300 feet wide so that multiple steamboats could go back and forth because the Mississippi was a busy, busy place, you don't you know. <laughs> they had so many restrictions on there. Uh, it couldn't be a drawbridge. It couldn't be a suspension bridge. I mean, they just added restriction after restriction after restriction to try to kill the project, to make it impossible to build. And when the, 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 the group building the bridge went to find bridge builders and engineers, they couldn't find anybody who was willing to take on the task because using conventional methods and conventional materials, it was now impossible. And no engineer or bridge builder wanted to risk their reputation in building something that was going to fail. In stepped James Buchanan Eads. Now, Eads had shown up in St. Louis uh, half a decade before as a young 13-year-old boy alone on the streets. He eked out an existence selling apples until he found a job as a clerk for a merchant. And this clerk happened to have a large private library, which he let this young man read in extensively. So Eads was self-educated, and as he was looking around, he noticed that, you know, going on the Mississippi River in those days was a very hazardous thing. Uh, there were snags, those are logs that, are, that are, have fallen into the river and have drifted and, and hung up, and they're under the water, but man, they can poke a hole in a boat. There were sandbars that were constantly shifting, and if that wasn't enough, the boilers on the steamboats themselves would occasionally explode, or the cinders coming out of the smokestacks would fall down on a boat, the boat or on a passing boat and set fire to the, the boat. Okay, And when any of these catastrophes happened, the cargo went to the bottom of the river. And the business owners were desperate to recover it. So they would pay good money to anybody who would salvage the, their, their goods for them. Well, James Buchanan Eads, in his reading, had found reference to diving bells. And looking about, he didn't see anybody using one. They would just hire men to swim down to the bottom of the river, or they would throw in a lot, big hooks and try to hook the, the goods down there and pull them up. So he built himself 
a boat that he called Submarine, and he took a 40-gallon wine cask, put on an air pump, and started diving down to the goods. And in a short time, he had the most successful salvage business, business on the river. He made a mint of money and retired at age 37. Can you imagine that? From diving into the, mis the muddy Mississippi River to get sunken goods. Well, the Civil War came along and Eads was young and hearty and he felt like he needed to contribute. So he put his mind to work. And uh, river traffic had dried up because the Confederacy wouldn't allow any steamboat to come up the river to St. Louis. So he designed flat boats with iron armor on the front and the sides and the top and loaded big cannons into them, the ironclads. Eads invented the ironclads and transformed both marine warfare and shipbuilding as a result. Well, when he heard that nobody was willing to take on the job of building a bridge across the river, he put his mind to work again. And despite the fact that he had never built a bridge or a building in his life, he was given the contract. He was a risk taker. Okay? And in 1867, he started building the... The Eads Bridge is what we call it today. And it did require innovation. I mean, for one thing, the bottom of the Mississippi is mud. And bedrock is almost 100 feet below the bottom of the river. How do you get foundations all the way down to bedrock when you've got this river flowing at 12 and a half feet per second. Well, <clears throat> he read. And he took a trip to Europe and talked to some engineers in Paris that were using something analogous to his diving bell. It's called a caisson, and it's like a hollow metal box with no bottom. And you sink it down in the river and then you put men inside the box and they shovel mud and muck into a device that removes it up the top and then you sink the case and down into the muck until it gets to the bottom to bedrock and then you fill it with concrete. So that's exactly what he did. He built the largest caissons in the world, the first caissons that had ever been used in the United States and the first pneumatic caissons because these had to be pressurized, okay? They'd been using open caissons which were just like little metal dams but they never, never uh, sunk them down. So he built these caissons, he took them, towed them out and he started building the, the masonry piers right on top of the caisson and used the masonry pier that was being built as the weight to sink the caisson. So he sunk it down until it hit the mud and then men walked down a spiral staircase, went through an airlock, and then started working down there. Everything went great. I mean, his design worked perfectly. Except that once they got below about 30 feet, as the workers came back, back up after their two-hour shifts, they started complaining of abdominal pain and pains in their arms and their legs. And the problems kept getting worse the deeper that they went. This was not a phenomenon that anybody had described before. Nobody knew what was going on. They called it caisson disease. And uh, he called in a doctor, and the doctor rightly surmised that the problem was the difference in air pressure down, in the, in, down below and up above. And so he started the first decompression chamber protocols. Now they built the caisson. They built the caisson on the Missouri side first, and while they were doing that, um, 17 men died, and over 70 were 
severely affected or permanently disabled. But by the time they got to the, the Illinois side, um, only one man died and m only a, a handful had severe problems. The decompression worked. That's just one of the hazards he had to overcome. The span was so great that uh, trusses, the usual way that they were building bridges, wouldn't work. They'd collapse, whether he used wood or metal, or wood or cast iron. So he went back to the way Romans built bridges, with arches underneath the road, and he started building them Roman style. Okay. But even that, the wood and cast iron were too weak, given that 300-foot arch he had to put in the middle. And so he turned to steel. This was the first major structural steel uh, used in construction. And it transformed the construction field because he proved that steel could be used safely and effectively, and it was lighter and stronger. Now, there were other engineering challenges that I can't even understand, okay? Those are just two examples of what he faced there. And he overcame those and they were moving forward. They were getting close to, um, you know, opening day. And the PR challenges started come, to come to the front, okay? Because all the time that he'd been building, the media had been stirring people up, you know? The, the media that was opposed to the bridge, they were telling stories to make people afraid, you know? You know, the bridge is going to keep sinking. You see how it's sinking now? Uh, as they, 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 it's going to keep sinking because the Mississippi is bottomless, you know? And, uh, or um, the first train that goes across, it's going to fall apart. I have a friend here in, in Fairfield, uh, Steve Lee, he researched his family history and he found records, a diary of one of his ancestors who traveled across the Eads Bridge and he recounted how his teachers in school, he had two professors who were diametrically opposed in their opinions about the bridge. Uh, one of them claimed that this was going to transform transportation. The other one said, no, it's going to fall apart when the first train goes apart, goes across, and that $10 million investment, that's the equivalent of more than a, a third of a billion dollars today, that's going to end up in the bottom of the river. So how do you overcome this PR challenge? Because, you know, a bridge is meant to be used, and this was going to be a toll bridge, and if nobody uses it, there's no toll to collect. So if people are afraid to step foot on the bridge, it's going to fail whether it's well built or not. So how do you overcome this? Eads found an innovative solution. There was a circus in town, and he went and rented an elephant, not to lift things on the work site. No, this was a demonstration. Because he had a sympathetic newspaper publish a myth that elephants had this instinct that let it, they would not step foot on an unstable structure. So he had them publish this, this, uh, this myth in the newspaper and say that he was going to give a demonstration and test his bridge to find out if an elephant would walk on it. A crowd showed up, and he led the elephant all the way to one end of the bridge to the other, okay? It was a rousing success. As the elephant came back, there were cheers, and people were enthusiastic, okay? That was the people. But what about the business owners who were going to send their goods across this bridge, and the railroads who were going to send their locomotives and their trains across it? Four days before opening day, he got the railroads to let him use 14 locomotives. And he, he put them end to end in tandem. He started at the Illinois side of the bridge and drove all the way across the river and back and forth and back and forth. I mean, he can. He demonstrated that this bridge was not going to fall apart with the weight of a train. 
Now, Vivian asked me, why did he use locomotives? Why didn't he use a regular train? Well, would you send goods across an untested bridge? Um, besides, a locomotive is the heaviest item on the train, so 14 of them, that was a big load. The Bible suggests that Jesus is the bridge to a satisfying life, to a meaningful life, to a spiritual life. How would we test it? I would propose that you have to test it the same way that the Eads Bridge was tested. You don't ask the opponents of the bridge what's going to happen and have them tell you all the reasons it's going to fail or all the inconsistencies. You load the bridge. You walk the elephant out on it. You drive the locomotives across it. And friends, that's exactly what the stories in the Bible are. Stories of men and women who have tested Jesus to find out if he leads to a satisfying life. And when you go to church, you're going to hear the same stories. Christianity doesn't start by solving all of the intellectual problems. And if we wait until the intellectual problems are started, are solved, before we will step on the bridge, well, the train will have already left the station. I know for myself, it took me a long time to get the courage to put my foot on that bridge. But he's never let me down. You have a good week, my friends. Stay safe, be prudent, and hopefully I'll see you again next week.